Hello, everyone, and welcome to this amazing moment. We were all like looking forward to this day, and I'm very happy to welcome you. Uh, this is our first webinar dash workshop um, that uh, is a result, a product of a project we are all working on. And we, I want to start by thanking the funders. Mother Cabrini Health Foundation was very important in making this work and um, thanking our entire team that works around the clock to actually change the discourse around forced migration, particularly thanking our women activists that were inspiring to me and continue to be inspiring to me, to all of us. And they are our best teachers. And that's why the idea of this series came. That's where the idea of this series came. So what you see today is the first of a series of webinars that will target different audiences. We start today by actually targeting social work students, faculty from social work schools in New York area, but also you know anywhere else, uh, and other students, because we want to actually address higher education institutions in general and see how can we change the way in which we approach forced migration. So I'm here today together with the co-director of the project, Dana Alonso, um, our project coordinator, Tanzilia Oren, and the team that will be introduced to you in a second. Um, Dana. Yes, um, just to build off of that, we're so thrilled to actually have um, the amazing women who are part of this project um, be able to speak to you and share their experiences and represent their community and advocate for their needs. And that's exactly what we're hoping um, we'll start today and to help um, shed light on and give perspective to the experiences that um, asylum seekers have here in New York City and how we can ensure that rights are being met, met um, needs are being met and services can be accessed and utilized in a way that is actually experienced as helpful and um, meeting needs. So um, I, I think that um, anyone who's here today is uh, lucky to be able to hear the stories that we're going to hear today. And um, uh, I look forward to our discussion. I want to introduce our speakers. Our speakers today are uh, two women activists who are live with us uh, in this meeting. And we'll have a recording also of um, stories recorded by other team members um, in this project. And uh, um, Caitlin Costello, will, uh, who is a student at Fordham, will um, facilitate and help us to move with the presentation. And uh, yes, let's start. Just a quick reminder, uh, we do have a question and answer section. Please send your questions there, write, write them down. We will be happy to have a question and answer, answer session at the very end. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. My name is Caitlin. I hope you all can see my screen and we're gonna kick this off. So we're really glad that you're here and thank you Marciana, Tanzilia and Dana for uh, speaking. Um, really excited to this presentation. Uh, our first question to you is, we really want you to think about what do you know about uh, forced migrants refugees, asylum seekers, and asylees. So Dana, I think you're gonna take this away. I think what we're gonna ask people to do is just take a minute to write down three things that when they hear these terms come to their minds, something they know as absolute truths about these um, communities. And then um, we'll revisit this after we've had a chance to hear some stories. Thank you. Sure. So we're going to go over a few terms and definitions, the first of which is what a forced migrant is. Uh, 
forced migrant is a person who's subjected to migratory movement in which there's an element of coercion. Uh, this can include threats to life and their livelihood, um, whether arising from natural um, or man-made disasters or man-made causes rather. So movements of refugees and internally displaced persons as well uh, as people displaced by natural or environmental disasters like chemical or nuclear disasters too, uh, famine or development projects. So this is separate from what a refugee is, which a, is a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of fear of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of uh, their nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country or who not having a nationality and being outside the country of their former habitual residence, as well as such events, events as unable or owing to such fear is any unwilling to return to it. Asylum seekers are people who under circumstances of forced migration are seeking international protection. Uh, so this is in countries with individualized procedures an asylum seeker is someone whose claim has not yet been fully decided on by the country in which he or she has submitted it. Uh, not every asylum seeker will ultimately be recognized as a refugee, but every recognized refugee is initially an asylum seeker. Asylees are asylum seekers who are granted asylum by the country or government they applied for asylum with. So great. Um, so while these definitions are meant to help you understand the difference between the terms, they do not by any means uh, truly express the depth of the experience of the individuals who are forced to leave their homes and the lives as they know it. Um, this is why we're very excited to introduce our first speaker, uh, a woman activist who will share her story with us now. My family lived the 30 years of a war between Ethiopians and Eritreans in the early 1970s. First, me. My apologies, we're having a technical difficulty. My family left the 30 years of a war between Ethiopians and Eritreans in the early 1970s, first making their way to Sudan, where they lived for two years before settling in Uganda during the Idi Amin regime. Somehow, my family managed to live through the Idi Amin and the Andobote regimes, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for, for everyone, Ugandans and non-Ugandans alike. Um, but if you were forward and foreign looking, um, and if you were of Indian descent in particular, you were at risk of, of being expelled from the country. The lighter skinned members of my family had to leave Uganda to Kenya for their safety. Um, females as well in my family, um, females of age also had to flee as it was particularly dangerous for young women of all backgrounds. Um, during routine raids and meetings um, because of the um, sexual violence that occurred. I, I was born during the second Obote regime. Um, following a violent raid in our apartment, my father decided to send me off to Kenya. There, I spent most of my childhood. Throughout this time, um, and before they left Ethiopia and during their time in Sudan, Uganda and Kenya, my family also was involved in the liberation of their home country, now Eritrea, which is the reason they stayed in the region. The hope was to one day return. It still is, I, I guess. Um, soon after I was born, 
uh, Ms. Levine gained control of Uganda um, and things somewhat stabilized in the country. But we were still not settled as a family. Uh, we did, however, have um, a small business, uh, the income of which was used to uh, bribe government officials, um, you know, to cross the border between Kenya and Uganda, for instance, or, um, you know, just to stay in business and um, to, to, to get by, you know, day to day. Uh, when Eritrea did eventually gain its independence in 91, my family continued its involvement in the new nation's political affairs. Uh, while this involvement over the years has been a source of pride for my family, it has also caused much pain, loss and complication. We continue to live a very scattered life. My journey to the United States began as a student in the Midwest. And while there were grounds for my seeking asylum when I initially came, um, I, I didn't. Um, I, I, I was just focused on school and was not fully aware of the, the process, but I understood it to be long. Um, from my experience serving as a translator for other Eritreans, other Eritrean refugees in Kenya and Uganda with the IOM, U.S. Embassy and various other embassies. And I did not want to jeopardize any travel to see family in the uncertainty. Eventually, some members of my family left the different parts of East Africa they were in to settle in other areas. My father, who's 84 years old, now lives in Canada. Um, he never imagined having to be in Canada at this stage in his life. I obviously stayed in the US during my time as a student. I, uh, I already was on edge because of the issues back home. Um, but I knew that I, uh, but I knew what I could and couldn't do within the US immigration context and was not intimidated in that regard. However, during my time as an asylum seeker, Living in, living in the Midwest, I was in a state of constant fear. It's like I was a different person because of my immigration status. I had no idea what the process entailed or what my rights were. I actually thought I had no rights whatsoever. And while I'd had encounters with uh, on-campus police as a student, my one and only encounter with the on-campus police as an asylum seeker left me very fearful. Uh, this encounter uh, was actually the reason for my move to New York City, where I knew if nothing else, I could blend in and live in hiding until I could figure out what I needed. In New York City, I experienced homelessness, joblessness, um, Finding jobs that could pay under the table was, was, wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. And when I did, I, I wasn't paid consistently. I fell ill a lot, um, but dealt with that on my own for fear of healthcare costs and my name surfacing with immigration for having gotten treatment without payment. Um, and my goal was really to to stay out of out of the scene um, until yeah um, I eventually found a job in Long Island working for a church, which was a big break for me, earning twenty dollars an hour for twenty hours a week. There were many nights I slept in the church office. After about a month in with this new job. I began to focus my energy on finding a good lawyer and reporting my transfer from um, the Midwest to New York City. Um, this is something I was supposed to have done 10 days after my move, but I couldn't until three or four months after my arrival to New York. I have since been able to connect with knowledgeable people and organizations in this process, which has been great but I continue to wait for the approval of my asylum case.
So as we are, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your story. This is powerful. And as we are moving to the next story, I just wanted to point one thing. There is a big disconnect between the way in which we frame asylum at the international level in international human rights laws and in refugee laws saying everybody has the right to seek asylum. Yet, based on the story you heard, and as you will see, validated by the following stories, the asylum process, as we know it, it's filled with violation of human rights. How do, two, how do, how do these two go together? If it is a right, how come to get asylum, you have to go through a series of violations of human rights? And with this, I will give the floor to our next woman activist, Vanessa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vanessa Rosales. I am a doctor and anesthesiologist from Venezuela. I have been living in the United States since in September 2017. I fled Venezuela with my husband and my young daughter after government forces placed bombs in my medical clinic and my apartment. And then they set fire to my neighborhood. <clears throat> Forced immigration has caused me many difficulties in my life. The first problem was my immigration status. I had to fly my country suddenly to save my life and my family. So I arrived in the United States with a, with a tourist visa. And this visa gave me the permission to stay in the US for only six months and with on the right to work. So I had to look for an organization or private lawyer to help me to change my immigration status for visit, from visitor to asylum seeker. Um, finding this help took me a long time. Hiring a private lawyer was not an option for me and my family because it was very expensive. Um, the organization that help people win the asylum petition process for free have long waiting lists. So I have to wait for an organization to take my case and offer me an a pro bono lawyer. Catholic Charity accept my case five months after I, after I arrived in the US. But then I had to wait a couple more months while Catholic charities looking for an, a volunteer lawyer who have the time to take my case. Finally, 11 months after my arrival, I was able to meet with a lawyer and prepare the documents for the asylum request. Surprisingly, I was called immediately to have the interview with the immigration officer but it was no easy process. It took me more than a year and I had to go back and forth many times to the immigration office in New Jersey. Mm, finding a job was another problem for me and my family. Mm, when you made a formal asylum request to immigration, you must wait six months before you can apply for work permit and social security number. In my case, my wait was even longer because my appointment to the asylum interview was rescheduled many times for different reasons. So my husband and I have, we don't have work permits for a long time. Therefore, the only work option we have were working in construction, restaurants, or as a babysitter and house cleaner. <laughs> I remember that I have to work in demolition. It's something that I never done before in my life. The work was hard, but the harder was the pay, as it was not fair, and the reason for the low pay was because we don't have work permit. So my husband and I have problem to, for, 
we have this problem for around almost two years. And as a consequence of it on the payment, another problem came up and was housing. <clears throat> for three years, my family and I had to live in a single room that we rented in a stranger's apartment. That was, a stressful, that was an stressful experience for all the members of the family, especially for my daughter. And the reason for this situation was, was that first, because we don't have enough money. And the second is because um, in that moment, we couldn't have the documents required to rent an apartment. <clears throat> Another challenge for my family and I was taking care of my health. For in my case, in the beginning, I don't have social security number. I don't have work permit, so I couldn't apply for a health insurance. And I remember in the third month when I arrived in this country, I got sick. Uh, as a doctor, I knew in that moment that I need medical care, but I was afraid to go to a hospital because I don't have money in that moment. So I decided to stay home. But as the day went by, my symptoms got worse. <clears throat> I remember that another immigrant woman realized my situation and she took me to a hospital. She assured me that I would receive health care regardless of my immigration status. In fact, when I got to the hospital, the first thing that I saw in the door was the sign that said, we don't care your immigration status, we care your health. Mm -hmm. In that moment, I didn't know that New York City offered emergency Medicare. And as a forced immigrant, I had the right to receive it. For that reason, that day I received medical treatment in that hospital for free. The hospital provided me with everything that I need in that moment. So be afraid and staying home, that was not necessary in that moment. But taking care of my physical health was challenging, but no more than my mental health. Really, this is so difficult to tell you, but the violent situation that I experienced in my country generate in me something called post-traumatic stress disorder. I experienced the first symptoms of the PTSD about three months after arriving in the United States. I feel depressed, scared and anxious. In addition, I was when homesick. Plus the stress of adjusting to a new culture, new language, climb, job and home. All of this increased my distress. The anxiety attack became more frequent and I I needed help in that moment, but I didn't have health insurance, so I didn't qualify for free psychotherapy. I did, I did go down a low cost institute, but I couldn't afford it even that. Eventually, I bought a volunteer psychology offered me help, but she didn't, but she didn't speak Spanish. I didn't speak English well and the communication was not good enough. As a consequence, the symptoms became more intense over the time, and I began suffering panic attacks. That made my life very difficult, and both work and home. Doing daily tasks became a challenge for me. After many visits to the emergency room because the panic attacks, I was referring to a social worker office. Then I met a social worker and I remember that she told me that I was her second forced immigrant patient with the diagnosis of PTSD in her career. 
still she knew what to do with me. We worked uh, around one month and a half, and then she found a perfect place for me. It is the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture, PSOT. Now I am receiving the appropriate help for my situation. Many difficulties have improved a lot since in July 2019, when my family and I were granted political asylum. So, my immigration status is defined as a, an asylum. Now, my husband has a health insurance, I have health insurance too, and we have social security numbers, we have work permissions. We don't any restrictions. We have better jobs opportunities. My daughter has a scholarship and she participates in the National Children's Corps of the United States. Um, I am a student at Lehman College. But the most important thing is that now I feel more secure and safe. Sadly, Many other asylums, asylum seekers are still in pending immigration status. Many of them have been waiting for years and still have no day to define their situation. They face similar challenges and difficulties like I described to you today. We are going to show you some of their histories. And the next section is about Dr. Doris from Venezuela. En la ciudad de Mérida. Este, como migrante forzado, mi mayor reto este aparte de aprender el idioma es poder insertarme en esta comunidad americana. Es poder este, ayudar a, a muchas personas con todos los conocimientos que adquirí en mi país. Eh, no ha sido fácil, no es fácil, ya que hay que, para poder ejercer en este país, hay que cumplir una serie de requisitos una serie de exámenes que poco a poco uno va resolviendo. Y pues para mí no ha sido realmente muy fácil. Lo otro es la parte emocional que te juega un, un sabotaje muy fuerte porque no es fácil dejar tu país, dejar tu zona de confort para venirte a un lugar donde estás sin familia, estás sin, dejas todo, dejas todo, todo, todo en tu casa, y aquí llegas este, solo con una maleta, y entonces emocionalmente esa también es uno de los, de los retos fuertes con los que he tenido que lidiar, este, pero bueno, gracias a Dios, gracias a mis amigos, gracias a ayudas profesionales, eh, he podido salir adelante, ¿sí? He podido, mm, de alguna manera, estabilizarme, ¿sí? Aún sigo mm, buscando eh, poder ejercer, pero, este, como ya les dije, no es nada fácil. Y bueno, como migrante forzada, tus emociones juegan un papel muy, muy, muy importante. Entonces, eh, nada agarrada de la mano de Dios, eh, buscando ayuda profesional y con amigos que están en la misma situación que yo, nos apoyamos y bueno, seguimos adelante. Nada, caminar, seguir. Thank you, Vanessa, and uh, thank you to Doris as well. Um, these stories are not singular. 
Many other women with lived experiences of forced migration share similar stories, stories of challenge and resilience. And the first story that we're gonna share, um, a quote from a story from one of the women activists is, you are afraid of so many things. You don't want to go against the law. I was concerned about public charge. For those of us that don't know what public charge is, it's basically where the government deems one um, a, a, a burden to the country and will make decisions based, based on that. Um, this is a, a story about a woman in, and her friends. When they emigrate to this country, they don't have jobs. So they were eligible only for emer emergency Medicare. But after getting a job, they were worried about the cost of Medicaid. So some of them decided not get insurance, and that is risky. And another, another decided, another day, decided to go back to their country, huh, and which is not the best solution. The translator had trouble understanding me. I realized that he did not speak French very well, the language I spoke. And it was serious for me because I had gastric ulcers problems. And so every time I go to the hospital, I report this because there are drugs that I cannot take. I reported this as usual. And unfortunately, this translator did not report this to the doctor. Luckily, when I got home, I used the translator on Google to try to read the notices. And there on a notice, it was well noted that people with gastric ulcer should not take this medication. I then called the doctor to change this medicine for me. She told me that the translator never told her that I said I had a gastric ulcer problem. It would have been more serious for me if I had not had the presence of mind to try to translate the notices myself to understand. I can read this one. Women ask why they have to get a certain gynecological test each year in Venezuela, but not here. I have to explain to them that we are in a country where the incidence is not as high. The people have tradition and here they're changing for another one. Sometimes they have to let the doctor know more here than in Venezuela. Specific exams in Venezuela are very expensive and here they are routine. Yes, exactly, this is the reason. I try to explain to my community about that. Many times I say, this is the only option you have. It's not bad because here it is a good health system. Once she had pain in her belly button, so she sent pictures to a doctor friend. Her skin was red and hard, so she went to the emergency room. People from Venezuela who know she's a medical doctor message her to explain their problems because they would rather avoid going to medical doctors because they don't know, they don't have the same connection to the Venezuelan doctors. Many don't feel connected to the doctors here by virtue of language and culture. So many people wait to the last moment to go to the doctor or only if they need to get medication. Sometimes people receive the wrong medication. After all of this information and all of these histories that you hear today, I would like to ask you something. As a future social worker, how will you use the information that you learned today to work with potential forced migrants you may encounter in need of social service? Some of one want to tell us some ideas. Please feel free to, you know, 
uh, write your questions in the question and answers or your ideas in questions and answers. This is the part where we want to work together. Uh, you heard the, the amazing stories and the struggles and the resilience. So now it's time for us to think, okay, what else do we need to know about? What else would help us to work together and address these issues? So what else do we need to know, but also what can we do with the information that we heard today and the stories that we heard? How do we take that information and use it in our practice? So there are there is some conversation in chat and one of them uh, it, it would be easier if you put in questions and answers if you have, have questions so we can monitor that better but uh, yes of course you know knowing your rights is important and you would be surprised that you know like on one hand even when people with lived experiences of forced migration know their rights they cannot access them so yes on one hand we need to make sure that information is provided on the other hand we need to make sure that once it's provided it is useful So the truth of the matter is that many migrants do not choose to settle on foreign soil. Um, and as we learn today and you know, through the stories of, of what those have shared with us, um, I think this could also be applied to how what we've been told of illegal immigration at the Southern border, it's definitely not the, tr the full or true story. Um, so we ask that you consider that as well. And we do see quite a few ideas. Thank you to those of you that started putting your ideas down. One was, you know, actually came very early in this conversation. Do you look for equivalences of your professional career? Um, and that's, that's an important question. Uh, I would like us to start shifting the burden. It's not, the burden shouldn't be on people that are coming here with already a career. The burden should be on us to think, where do we need to change systems? So, you know, equivalency can be obtained faster and in an easier way. I mean, Vanessa is a doctor and she needed to go through so many hoops while we do need doctors. Uh, so, you know, like on one hand, yes, you want an equivalency. On the other hand, how can we work to make sure that that's more accessible? Treating people as equal, yes, and learn. And I have to say, learning from the people that are going through this is the most important. I had many teachers in my life. Uh, not so many as amazing as the two ladies that you know taught us today what it means to go through these challenges and we it's time that we listen you know we think as social workers as scholars that we know it all we don't we need to listen that's how we can do advocacy bob says you know like yeah we need to work to raise awareness absolutely but we need to understand what kind of awareness is needed and where and what are we not doing the right way what are we doing the right way vanessa said you know, I was told that my immigration status doesn't matter, that my health comes first. Yes, we need more messages like that. So I think that kind of took us through all the comments in the, in the questions and answers. So thank you so much. If any other questions, uh, please, this is the time. We do have a few more minutes. So if you have any other questions before we get to the closing, this is the time to ask them. I want to make a comment also while we're waiting um, for questions. What? My comment is about people, right? Give them resources, let the people know. But the issue that the asylum services for asylum seekers are not funded on the federal level at all. And local governments very rarely give any money to um, develop services or provide services to asylum seekers. To find the legal representation is almost impossible because pro bono legal help is in short supply and very stretched and there is no um, funding sources uh, for legal support. As for social services, local governments, like in New York City, we have um, options for people who are undocumented or asylum seekers at the um, in, ho in public hospitals, but that's all and emergency Medicaid maybe, but it's very um, state um, dependent because some states provide this and some do not at all. Uh, even emergency Medicaid is not available uh, in uh, many other states. So yes, there are resources uh, that 
uh, people can access to, but just to remind you, asylum seekers do not receive uh, any official services, only private funding, some nonprofits provide um, some services. But again, we should advocate for larger, more universal access. And for this, it requires funding, it requires uh, willpower from the top to provide some kind of um, safety net for asylum seekers, because as for right now, the asylum seekers do not receive anything because we just don't have funding on the government level. Yeah, thank you, Tanzilia. This was extremely important. Um, there were other questions uh, and comments, both in chat and question and answer, and mostly refer to how do we make sure that people have the information on existing resources and rights and where could they find this information? So uh, basically, um, if you see here on the screen, we have the website that we started working together with our women activists, because I think we need to hear from them. What did they try? What didn't they work? And then the social work students that are on the team are also working to find out what are the rights in New York City? What policies exactly? As Estazilia took you through some of them at the national level and at the, uh, you know, at New York City level, we need to have that information in one place. So this is the website. It provides information on rights, on healthcare services, on other resources. Uh, we are working around the clock trying to expand the lists. We also have translations provided both in um, Spanish and Russian. We will be moving, hopefully, to try to translate them in, in French as well and possibly other languages. Um, so what yeah, go ahead. Anyway. So just to expand on that, because I think what's so unique about this, um, this website and this resource is that it's not just a sort of receptacle of a list of services, but um, users can get personalized feedback around to meet their needs and the kinds of services that they're looking for, but they can then also provide information to others in the community about whether those services were effective or not, what their experience was like used trying to access that um, that resource for care and whether it was helpful or, or not potentially harmful um, and to look for a community right to share experiences with um, to post stories to look for others who have had similar experiences and build community and connect with others that have had similar challenges and to learn from one another, um, as well as a, a hub for training and education and to access resources like today's webinar, right, or to, and, and today's talk and um, hear from the community. Absolutely. Thank you, Dana. And I'll come back to you because I'd like you to bring us home with the first question, everything. But I just wanted to add one more thing. I think what is what we learned through the work we were doing for the past almost a year now, um, is that we all need to think what is our responsibility as social workers, as citizens, as people that have more rights, as women, as human beings, what is our responsibility? Because we all have a collective responsibility to make sure that people's rights are being protected. And then, you know, we also have to question ourselves at a wider level, at a higher level, what is the responsibility of the United States? I know it's a hard one to talk about, but, you know, like on one hand, we're thinking, okay, there is a burden on existing resources, which is not necessarily true. Um, but on the other hand, we contributed to creating crisis around the world. We cannot just say it's not our responsibility. Yes, it is our responsibility. And even if we had no contribution at all, it will still be our responsibility. Because asylum and requesting asylum is a human right. And that cannot be denied. And having people having to go through the stories, through the challenges that you heard in the stories, it's just not okay. At a national level, for everything that the United States stands for, at the New York City level, although New York is doing a lot of great things, but we can do better at a social work level. I mean, what more important task than really thinking, how can we truly respond? How can we truly step back and learn from the people that know what works and doesn't work and how can we work with them? And Dana, I'll pass it now on to you. 
Thank you. Um, and, you know, I just want to thank the amazing women that shared their stories with us today and put themselves in such a vulnerable position to um, talk about some of the most difficult experiences that you've had to allow others to learn from you. Um, and I'd like to circle back to where we started today, where we said, think of three things that when you hear these words describing these communities, forced migrants, asylum seeker, refugee, that you believe to be true. And to take another minute now, right, or after we end in a minute, and think about whether those things still hold true after you've heard the stories and heard the challenges and experiences um, from the people who have lived them. Um, and then think about what do we do from here, right? If those things do hold up, then great. How do you take that, help others understand it, and move us forward through policy and practice in the community. Um, and if they don't ring true any longer, then how do we help others who might have those same misperceptions to challenge their misconceptualizations about um, these populations and perhaps stereotypes or generalizations that they make and, and to start to think in a different way? So what kind of advocacy is needed as Marciana was speaking to, as Tanzilia was speaking to, right, to help challenge those misconceptions. So I'll leave us there. You're muted, my dear. Maybe leave a few minutes for people to think about if you want to add anything and go back to what you wrote. People commented that yeah. uh, there is IRC, there are other agencies, but uh, again, to point your attention that IRC, they do not routinely serve asylum seekers only in very emergency situations like people who are just released for detention, families and children. Um, but we have so many asylum, thousands of asylum seekers living in the city who are affirmative asylum seekers are waiting for the court uh, who are not qualified to receive um, help from resettlement agencies or from IRC or for Catholic charities or not. They do not have services specifically for asylum seekers. And women here can confirm that, right? Yeah. And, and actually, I think that maybe our voices shouldn't be the last ones of the day. In the chat, someone asked, um, are there recommended ways that we can promote a sense of safety um, for uh, women asylum seekers right, to talk about some of their challenges or to feel more comfortable and safe. And so maybe we can hear from um, the women that are here today and share their stories to, uh, and see if they have any thoughts about that and we can give them the last word. I just want to say thank you for, for being here and um, listening. Um, yeah, Vanessa, if you want to say something? Mm, yes. Um, I remember when I went to the social worker office um, and I met this, this woman, amazing woman. In that moment, included to go to the bathroom and by myself alone, taking a shower, that was something difficult in my life because I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna die when I took in a shower. Probably something stupid. But, and that's, I told you this because I'm gonna let you know how I feel in that moment, how I felt in that moment, and how this amazing person helped me to find a, a good place the perfect place for me and the correct place that I received legacy help, mental help. Um, and, she, and I remember she worked with me each week. Each week she called me, Vanessa, are you okay? Vanessa coming to the appointment tomorrow with me. Um, and she took my hand and, and, when, and when she found the correct place, she left me and she said, if you need something for me, you know where is my office, you are welcome here. Um, that was something that as a forced immigrant, I want to let you know that we need more that kind of people. 
we need more we need more of that kind of professional in the hospitals that understand the situation of the, some patients and find the correct help for each one thank you thank you thank you again for sharing for being vulnerable for letting us enter your stories and for teaching us uh, what we need to know in order to work together. We want to, you to stay tuned. We, as we said, this is the first of a series of webinars and workshops, all organized uh, in a participatory way, working uh, with amazing women whose stories will continue to inspire you. Next webinar will be on reproductive health and it will be followed by a series of webinars on mental health. So please stay tuned. We'll let you know when those will be presented. Yes. And thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you.